what, why is it worth a discussion is the question I was asking. And I think it's because of the way in which Roth captured the general intellectual, cultural and moral climate um, and the palpable sense of decay that, that, was, that was of change and uncertainty that prevailed in the, in the years leading up to the outbreak of the First World War. One of the key moments in the book that I think really sums up the temporality, that, that movement through time that the book is infused with, is the duel between Demont and, uh, or Demont, I don't know how you pronounce it, and Count Tattenbach, um, when Demont's father-in-law, Nofmacher, sorry to the Germans, I can't pronounce these words properly, um, refers to it as so out of date, that code of honour, this is the 20th century after all. And it is the 20th century and the code of honour is old hat, but there isn't yet any sense of, of what the future will be. And throughout the book, there is this sense of the old disappearing, but uncertainty and foreboding is what's coming. So what I want to do is examine from a literary point of view how Roth uses metaphors and language uh, so brilliantly to portray that sense of an ending. Um, and then, uh, so, but first I want to talk a little bit about Roth himself, uh, how he's a cipher for capturing the changes that were occurring. Then talk a bit about the historical context that the book set in. And finally, uh, why I think it's relevant to today. So firstly about Roth. Um, in many ways, he personifies the disintegration of the, of the then world order. He was born in 1894 in Brody, a small Galician town in what is now Western Ukraine. And his description of the garrison town to which um, Carl Joseph Trotter transfers, transfers himself is apparently a description of Brody. And Roth uses the description of Brody in pretty much every one of his novels. Different places, but they're all a description of Brody. Roth was a Jew living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, a multinational empire that was held together by an autocratic monarch, Franz Joseph. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, Austro-Hungary was a very safe place for Jews, and Jews were largely protected. It was one of the most tolerant places in the world for Jews. So consequently, when the... Uh, when the monarchy, the, the, the monarchy was actually supported by a huge Jewish population. There were about two million Jews in Austro-Hungary, the whole of the empire, about 5% of the population. So it was a very significant part of the population. And I think Roth was very conscious as a Jew that the end of the empire uh, would mean a lot, particularly for Jews. The, the relative protection that they had within the empire Roth knew would leave him with no home, physically, uh, culturally, and emotionally. He, he, he would be homeless in all senses. And so it actually happened. At the end of the, uh, the, when, the when the empire broke up, what ha happened to Roth was that he ended up wandering through Europe, working in Berlin, working various places, wandering about Europe, and actually ended up disappointed and delusioned, uh, disillusioned um, drinking himself to an early death in Paris when he was just 45 in May 1939. So he, he as I say, is a, it's a real cipher for what happened to the empire. And a bit about the historical context. Um, the Radetzky March starts in the secure world of Emperor Franz Joseph and moves on to a time uh, at the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the book, as I said, brilliantly conveys that atmosphere of slow disintegration. Um, the empire um, break, the, the breaking links, people's links with the security of their long-held beliefs and the values that form the frameworks uh, for their lives. And the main characters are carried along by events that uh, finally lead to the Great War, World War I. So in this time, the nationality question was constantly bubbling. And um, in fact, throughout Franz Joseph's reign, uh, that 
that the nationality question bubbled all the way through. And uh, <coughs> however, uh, France Joseph reigned from 19, 1848 to 1916 when he died and was the longest serving emperor in history, in fact. But the, the Radetzky March doesn't start then, it starts in 1859 when the emperor was defeated at the Battle of Solferino, and that's when it begins with its big bang at the beginning of the book. And that battle resulted in the victory of the, uh, what was known as the Franco-Sardinian Alliance. As an aside, interestingly, it was actually the last major battle in world history that was actually um, the armies were under the personal command of their monarchs. It was the last time that ever happened. So the book continues until the outbreak of World War I, and during that time there were permanent constitutional crises. And in 1867, the dual monarchy was formed, which stabilised the multi-ethnic region of, of, of Austria-Hungary, Austria -Hungary, and uh, was pretty peaceful for a period of almost 40 years. So it was very stable for that period. Um, the dual monarchy was formed between um, what was Austria and the Kingdom of Hungary, and uh, basically uh, was, was a constitutional monarchy and, and a great power in Central U Europe between 1867 and 1918. And it was a dual monarchy between, um, as I say, the Austrian Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary. So that was, that was formed in the aftermath of the Austro-Prussian War and was dis dissolved shortly after its defeat in the First World War. So that's a bit of historical context. Um, so why is it actually called the Radetzky March? Beautiful piece of music you just heard. Well, the march was actually the unofficial Austrian anthem. But more than that, Radetzky was a veteran of military glory. So he was a really successful military man. Um, and uh, the measure of his success was that um, during his lifetime, Austria actually won wars. Uh, after his death came what's known as the evil days when when Austria was continually beaten by Napoleon, by Bismarck, and then in World War I. So Radetzky was somebody who had been a successful militarist. And um, in, in contrast, uh, Franz Joseph lost almost all the wars that he, he fought. But it, it's the Radetzky march that plays on throughout the book that holds the book together. It's that one of those devices by which Roth manages to, to bind his story together. So uh, I read the Radetzky March several years ago, actually, for a book club discussion. And yet, when I reread it this time for, for, for today, I, I found it completely a different book almost. I appreciate it a hell of a lot more. And I think probably because it speaks to the moment of today more than it did then, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago or so, um, but, but more about that later anyway. So I love a good storyteller, and I think Roth is a brilliant storyteller. He, he's, his writing is incredibly descriptive. Um, apparently he was a, a, an atmospheric travel writer as a journalist, and I think that really comes through. You can hear the music he describes. Uh, you can be in the middle of summer when he describes summer and feel the, the fog and the mist when he talks about being in the swamplands. And just a taste of what I mean is when he describes the orchestra playing the Radetzky March. The rugged drums rolled, the sweet flutes piped, and the lovely cymbals shattered. The faces of all spectators lit up with pensive smiles and the blood tingled in their legs. Though standing, they thought they were already marching. It's just, that's it, that's the music. And the summer, yes, it was summer. The old chestnut trees opposite the district captain's house moved their dark green crowns with rich, broad foliage, only mornings and evenings. During the day, they remain, remained motionless, exhaling a pungent breath and sending their wide, cool shadows all the way to the middle of the road. The sky was a steady blue. Invisible larks warbled incessantly over the silent town. 
and then further the spring in the borderlands. The Forsythia was already glowing on the slopes of the railroad embankment. The violets were already blossoming in the damp woods. The frogs were already croaking in the endless swamps. The storks were already circling over the low thatched roofs of the rustic huts, seeking the old wheels, the foundations of their summer homes. Just really wonderfully descriptive. But obviously it's a lot more than that. It's much more than a, a fantastically descriptive story. And while it tells the, the story of three generations of the Trotter family, and that's nothing to do with only fools and horses, I think, <laughs> it conveys the slow decay of an era, an era of stability into one of, of uncertainty. And I think like all good novelists, what Roth does is he presents the events, the great events that are happening, but only as they're reflected in the characters, that he, in the lives of the characters that he writes about. So how does he do this? How does he portray this atmosphere of decay? I think the first trotter that we're introduced to, right at the beginning of the book, at the Battle of Salferino, is, is, the, is, is the guy who saves the emperor and uh, is consequently ennobled and becomes Baron Joseph von Trotter and Unzipulje. The first sense, I think, is then when, of something going awry. It comes when he picks up this reader that's been assigned to his child at the age of five, and he finds himself confronted with what he calls a pack of lies. Not only is he cast as a Superman hero in this son's reader, which he feels is entirely without merit, but the details of what actually happened have been transformed even further to appeal to the young audience. And it seems like the idea of heroism itself is being called into question as far as he's concerned. Um, and he cannot reconcile the lies in the reader with his idea of how the army should conduct itself. And so he leaves the army. And as Roth says, he'd been driven from the paradise of simple faith in the emperor and virtue, truth and justice. And now, fettered in silence and endurance, he may have realized that the stability of the world, the power of laws and the glory of majesties were all based on deviousness. So here begins the hint of the start of the downward spiral that the book so wonderfully evokes. The hero Solferino leaves the army feeling disillusioned with the world and all that he's known. But then I think the atmosphere builds and builds until you get, and, and really starts when you get Carl Joseph and the district captain, his father. And while it's hard to single out events that are key in portraying that atmosphere of change and decay, it takes on real force after Carl Joseph feels he must transfer into the rifle battalion after the death of his friend de Mont in the duel that I spoke about at the beginning. It's this point when all the old ways are questioned and nothing yet is clear about the future. So to remind you, Carl Joseph feels responsible because he's escorted uh, his friend de Mont's wife home, but his fellow officers, when they see him with her, wrongly assume that he's having an affair with her. So when a, one of the officers drunkenly confronts de Mont with the news, de Mont calls him a drunken scoundrel but the officer replies by crazily yelling, yid, 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 which, which results in the duel that ends with uh, de Mont and the officer's death. Both of them die. So then Carl Joseph is so upset about the role he played in bringing about that duel, he, trans himself, he transfers himself off to the borderlands and the swamp. I have absolutely no idea whether Roth read Lenin's What is to be Done or not, although he was, at the beginning, called Red Roth. So I have an inkling that he probably did read it. But in any case, whether he, he read it or not, it does bring to mind um, the metaphor that Lenin used when he described those taking the path of conciliation as people straying into the marshes, where inevitably they will be swallowed up by political enemies and be unable to stick to their hard-fought principles. You could read that as the marsh stroke swamp, was for people without principles who would drag you down, a metaphor not unlike the one that Roth, Roth uses. Roth paints a picture of the borderlands as somewhere that's a place for those on the edge of society, 
and already in decline. Hence, Carl Joseph's transfer is a metaphor for the move to an uncertain but definitely worse future. The people in this area were the spawn of the swamps, for the swamps lay incredibly widespread across the entire face of the land, on both sides of the highway, with frogs, fever germs, and treacherous grass that could be a horrible year into a horrible death for innocent wanderers unfamiliar with the terrain. Many died, and their final cries for help went unheard. But all the people who were born there knew the treachery of the swamps and had something of that treachery themselves. And further, any stranger coming into this region was doomed to gradual decay. No one was as strong as the swamp. No one could hold out against the borderland. By this time, the high-placed gentlemen in Vienna and St. Petersburg were already starting to prepare for the Great War. The borderlanders felt it coming earlier than others, not only because they were used to sensing future things, but also because they could see the omens of doom every day with their own eyes. Any number of them lived from spying and counter-spying. They received Austrian guldens from the Austrian police and Russian rubles from the Russian police. And in the isolated, swampy bleakness of the garrison, one or another officer fell prey to despair, gambling, debts, and sinister men. So one of these borderlanders and future censors was Szoznicki, the Polish count, and he, be he bemoaned the changing times. The empire is doomed. The instant the Kaiser shuts his eyes, we'll crumble into a hundred pieces. The Balkans will be more powerful than we. All the nations will set up their own filthy little states, and even the Jews are going to proclaim a king in Palestine. Vienna already stinks of the sweat of the Democrats. I can't stand on being on Ringstrasse anymore. The workers have red flags and don't care to work. The mayor of Vienna is a pious janitor. The padres are already going with the people. Their sermons are in check. The Berg Theatre is playing Jewish smut. And every week, a Hungarian toilet manufacturer becomes a baron. <laughs> I tell you, gentlemen, if we don't start shooting now, we're doomed. We'll live to see it for ourselves. So Karl Joseph attends uh, Szoznicki's soirees, and unlike his fellow officers, he feels the dark weight of Szoznicki's <coughs> prophecies. And Szoznicki is also the one that introduces Karl Joseph to 180 proof. This liquor is what connects Karl Joseph's physical decay to the decay of the empire. Another dark foreboding figure arrives in the shape of Capturac, people smuggler, gambler, and moneylender. In those days, there were a lot of men like Capturac on the borders of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. They began to circle around the old empire like those black, cowardly birds that ogle a dying man from infinitely far away. Dark and impatient, beating their wings, they wait for his end. Their slanting beaks jab into their prey. No one knows where they come from or where they fly off to. They are the feathered brethren of enigmatic death. They are the harbingers, his escorts, and his successors. So, not good. Just um, one of the things that a lot of people have noted about the Radetzky March is that women don't feature much in it. And when they do they aren't uh, treated very well. And I think Roth's treatment of women in the book, he uses to highlight the moral decline of the empire. So Carl Joseph's affair with Frau Tausig and previously um, his youthful affair with Frau Slammer, uh, both women are married, both are considerably older than Carl Joseph. Um, and in, in addition to that, Frau Damon comes appears to be coming on to him soon after the death of her husband in the duel. So it all uh, seems quite morally questionable at that time. And as Stefan Zweig wrote, expectations of women at that time were that they would know nothing, they would be beautiful, and they would just wait for marriage and get ready for it, whilst young men were trained by their fathers uh, about visiting prostitutes before marriage. So that was the kind of relative... You're either a, a young lady waiting to get married and then married, or you were a prostitute. That was it. So I think it, it, it very much um, Roth portrays women 
um, contrasting with the accepted morals of the time, morals in decline. So while out in the rifle battalion in the swamplands, as well as having an affair with Frau Chausig, Carl Joseph is charged with putting down striking workers with violence if necessary. And when confronted with the internationally singing demonstrators, for all of a single rapid moment, the lieutenant had the sublime ability to see images. And he saw the times rolling toward one another like two little rocks. And he himself, the lieutenant, was smashed between them. So then we have another character who I think serves again as all these people who are, are really uh, showing the way that the empire's going. But Jacques, the old servant, is a really key figure, I think. And his death really does mark the end of an era. It very keenly evokes the sense of loss and times changing. And District Captain Trotter, who of probably all the characters in the book, desperately tries to hold on to the values of the empire. He's totally at sea when Jack dies. He even tries to find another servant that will accept being called Jack so that he can bandage over his own sense of loss. And the time, of course, it doesn't work. Nobody's prepared to, to either accept being Jack as a servant or Jack being called Jack either. So then we move on towards the end. We have the scene of the regimental summer festival, the practice run for the centennial celebration the following year. And here, I think it's quite a common metaphor used by novelists of the gathering storm. But in this case, I think it's used brilliantly as the, the supernatural link between the chance arrival of the storm and the terrible news of Franz Ferdinand's assassination. And in the chaos of all of the festival guests rushing into Szoszlicki's home to avoid the storm, they failed to notice the theatrical messenger of war arriving with the message that the heir to the throne had been assassinated in Sarajevo. And so begins the Great War, the First World War. Finally, Carl Joseph dies ingloriously collecting water with the sounds of the Radetzky march in his head. And Roth reflects here the inglorious way in which the Habsburg Empire finally ended. The professional officer corps of which Carl Joseph was a member had been nearly wiped out by the end of 1914. Yet, as the historian Gunther Rottenberg states, the remarkable thing was that the Habsburg army, shackled by a complicated and unsteady political and social structure, with an inefficient mechanism of coordination and control, had held out for so long. So another literary element that I want to examine is the relationship between fathers and sons. And the relationships between fathers and sons reflect and give poignancy to those changing times that are reflected in the characters as well. The relationships, to some extent, appear unchanging. So they're all very formal with their sons. The fathers are very formal with their sons. They write formal letters to each other. But the tension between father and son appears to grow with each generation. So while the first father and son relationship is distant, the now aristocratic Captain Joseph Trotter tries to reneg renegotiate his relationship with his father after saving the emperor's life and being ennobled. His father's a war invalid and a groundskeeper who's distant both physically, and he hasn't seen him for five years, and emotionally. And this is further complicated due to their changes in relative circumstances. It's really over, thought Captain Trotter. His father was separated from him by a heavy mountain of military ranks. The second father and son relationship between the hero of Zolfrino and his son also remains formal. Once away in law school, his son visits just twice a year in Christmas and summer, and it seems quite a harsh and cold relationship. Never was the son given a toy, never an allowance, never a book aside from the required school books, but he did not seem deprived. And that relationship seems to warm up a bit when um, the son brings his friend Moser with him one summer. He's the painter of the portrait of the hero of Solferino that hangs in his study 
and actually brings joy to the old man. And then the, 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 the portrait features through, throughout the book. But in general, there's a similarity of formality and chill in their relationship. Finally, there's the relationship between the district captain and Carl Joseph. And Carl Joseph, in fact, isn't introduced until he's 15. And he visits his father only in the summer holidays. He summoned his father's study every Sunday morning to be examined about his reading and conduct at military school. And their rela relationship is only slightly less formal than the previous one uh, between father and son. Uh, it's marked by them finishing their meals at the same time. But their relationship is more changed by the way in which the district captain feels he has to bail out his son um, after Carl Joseph's disastrous choices, all in the name of keeping the honour of the Trotter family. The district captain's secure in his belief of the eternal world of the Habsburgs, but he realises that times are coming to an end through the complete mess that his foolish son, he's tried hard to raise in his image as a loyal <coughs> servant of the empire. Herr von Trotter sat helpless next to his son. He felt that the cries of help were coming out of the boy and he could not help. He'd come to the borderland as he goes out to visit him in, in the swamp to find a little help himself, for he was all alone in the world and this world too was going under. His son was likewise alone and perhaps being younger was closer to, to the collapse of the world. So the district captain Trotter still tries to guard the family honour in the face of this Carl Joseph's continuing descent. Fate has turned our family of frontier peasants into an Austrian dynasty. That is what we shall remain. Thus their relationship is very marked by changing times. The father nostalgic and keen to maintain the standing of the Trotter family and the old social values, while Carl Joseph is just basically spiralling out of control. He transfers, he's transferred off to the swampy borderlands, gets into all sorts of trouble, providing dubious friends with financial guarantees, having a fair, becoming complete drunkard. And he's, his father sees no alternative, however, to bail him out, not just to save the Trotter name, but in his view, to try to save the empire itself. In the course of that day, Herr von Trotter had come to believe that his son's concern was now the hero of Solferino's concerned, and thereby the Kaiser's, to some extent, the fatherland's concern. So why talk about it particularly now? As It's a fantastic book to be read any time, absolutely. But um, if you look at father and son, the, the kind of generational wars that are going on today, you'll find some fathers and sons arguing about empire, not the Austro-Hungarian empire, but the British empire. And the, the generational co and culture wars of today, very much about questioning the old ways and making, you know, dying, denying anything good about the past at all. So while many older people would actually see benefits from what the British empire meant for the world at that time, it was when it was thriving and would want to cling on to some of those values today. Like the district captain, Carl Joseph's father, the zeitgeist of today's generation is to see everything the British Empire did as bad. And in fact, the House of Lords Justice and Home Affairs Committee actually, at the beginning of this month, we're talking about changing the life in the UK test for UK citizenship. And they felt that they needed to change it because it describes the British Empire as having once been thought of as a force for good in the world. Whereas today, the British Empire, of course, is thought of by pretty much everyone uh, as entirely evil. So it's, it, it, uh, it just happened at the beginning of the month, so it's an interesting point. While many of the generation, this generation want to ditch anything good about the past, um, there's nothing certain, there's nothing, there's no views about a future. And the changes and sense of loss that Roth so clearly portrays in the book speak to us now as we seem to be at the end of another era and, and a, a beginning of a, another period of uncertainty. There is no longer peace in Europe. The relative stability of the past 75 years has gone 
and the revenge of history is palpable. And the sense of existential loss felt by Roth and reflected in his characters that came from the end of 40 years of stability within the Austro-Hungarian Empire now seem more relevant than ever. And that sense of loss is evident as many within Europe are confronted with the real issue of national sovereignty. And everything that appeared solid now gives way to existential angst. The borderlanders of today, those in Ukraine, as I understand, Ukraina in Slav vernacular actually means the borderlands. Like those borderlanders depicted in the Radetzky March, um, must have felt it coming earlier than the others, the people in Ukraine. They must feel more now how the revenge of history is upon us. Many believe that we'd left the past behind us and that the issues that gave rise to the Great War were resolved. I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine starkly confronts these assumptions. And the fact that so much of the book is actually set in the Ukraine uh, makes it even more, uh, even closer to the events of, of, uh, of today. And I think the, the real human experience that he portrays in the book at, of the end of an era and an absence of certainty is even more poignant now. Thank you.